Solar 101, a beginner's guide to owning solar, 2022 edition. This third and final part of my Solar 101 video series brings us to this. Your solar system is now installed on your roof. Yes. What next? My advice is to bookmark this video so you can refer to it over the years and keep your system in tip top shape. Let's get to it. Point one, your installer has finished up and waved goodbye. What now? It's the end of the day and the installers have tidied up, packed up their things and left. What can you do right now to check the install? Here are the major things you can check on your installation with a quick walk around your property. Firstly, on your wall. Your solar inverter. Is it mounted in a location that doesn't get direct sunlight? Now look, a couple of hours of sunlight is fine, especially if it's the less harsh morning or evening sunlight. But if the solar inverter is in the sun for most of the day, ask your installer to put a simple shade over it. DC and AC isolators. Does the conduit enter the isolators from the top or the bottom of the isolator? If the conduit enters from the top, you'll need to get your installer to come back and fix them. Exterior isolators that have top entry are asking to get water in them. Interior mounted isolators are more of a gray area, but it's still possible for condensation to form and enter them. So bottom entry is what you want regardless. Ooh, sounds a bit rude. For the cabling around the inverters, does the cabling look tight and tidy? Loose wiring is asking to get snagged on something as people walk by and it looks shit house. Up on your roof. Assuming you can see your installation from your yard and without having to risk life and limb climbing up on the roof, is there any exposed flexible conduit running across the roof between solar panel arrays? I hate seeing this. The sun will degrade the exposed flexible conduit over time and open you up to all sorts of issues. Are the solar panels aligned? If they can't get the solar panels straight and there's no good reason for it, like avoiding a stink pipe, I'll bet other things aren't right with the installation either. Is the railing trimmed at the edges or is it sticking out like Pinocchio's nose? How close are the panels to the edge of your roof? They need to be about 150 millimeters from the edges in most cases. It can be hard to tell from the ground, but if they're actually overhanging your gutter, then you've got a problem. Do the clamping zones, where the panels attached to the rail, look right? This is another one that's hard to tell from the ground, but if your panels resemble a diving board, you've got a problem. Do the panels get any shading from nearby trees, TV antennas, chimneys, etc.? If they do, has your installer made you aware of the potential lost output, and have they proposed using microinverters or optimizers to mitigate the effects of this shading? Does the rooftop isolator, if you've got one, they're optional now, thank God, does it have a shroud to protect it from the sun? Uh, documentation from the installer. You're unlikely to remember the brands of components installed on your home. Or let's be honest, even the name of your installer in five plus years, if you've got a memory like mine anyway. Documentation will tell you where to turn if something hits the fan so you can minimize the downtime of your system. I've put a link in the video description to a list of all the documentation you should have from your installer. They need to provide this, it's in the Australian standard, and they should provide it on the same day as the install, but cut them some slack, some can take a week or two, and I think that's all right, as long as you get it. Point two, waiting, waiting, waiting for your meter. When your solar installer has finished, they will turn on your solar system to check it's working and show you it's working. Then they'll shut it off again. Wait, what? Unfortunately, it's unlikely your existing meter can handle solar straight away. It'll need replacement or reconfiguration, which is your electricity retailer's responsibility, your origins, your AGLs, and those guys are not known for being quick. Replacement can take weeks or even months, like for one of my employees who lives in a strata complex with a shared meter board. Waiting for your retailer to arrange meter replacement can be really frustrating. And it's even more frustrating for your installer as they want you to have that functioning solar system ASAP. Just know that delays to the meter replacement process are out of your installer's hands. You're at the mercy of your retailer. Sorry. Costs for replacement of your meter vary from retailer to retailer and state to state. Some will replace the meter for free, some will charge a small fee, and some may slug you with the full cost of the meter, $300 or more. Point three, unlocking the true savings of solar, shifting your loads. As I talked about in part two of this guide, 
which I've linked to in the description, self-consumed solar energy is worth anywhere from two to seven times more than exported solar. This is a powerful financial incentive to run your appliances during the daytime. Consider, can you run your washing machine or dishwasher while you're at work instead of overnight? Timers are really handy for this. If your home has a lot of thermal mass, run your air conditioner during the day to cool down your house and make it comfy at night. If you have a pool pump, you're crazy if you're running it overnight. Adjust it to run during the daytime only. The bottom line is common sense changes to your energy habits are your golden ticket to low or no electricity bills. Point four, the sanity check. Have your bills gone down since you've had your solar installed? Every now and then, I'll get an email or a phone call from a homeowner that goes something like this. Hey Finn, I got solar installed, but my latest bill is almost the same as last year's. What the hell's going on? If they took my advice in part two of this guide and bought a consumption monitor, I could answer this in about two seconds flat. It is no coincidence that 99% of the people who ask this don't have consumption monitoring. So operating on that assumption, first things first, make sure that your solar system has been operating for a full billing cycle. Use your inverters app to check this. Assuming it has, check your bill for evidence of your system's impact. You'll be looking for solar exports. Look for a CR on your bill and a reduction in grid usage. Solar exports will show up as a credit on your bill called a feed-in tariff and look something like this. Your reduction in usage, thanks to solar, will look something like this. If you've had a full billing cycle and can't see any solar feed-in credits, call your energy company. One of my friend's parents had solar for years and didn't realize their plan had no feed-in tariff. If you do have credits and your usage hasn't changed much or has even gone up, you're likely using more energy at night than you used to. Or it could be that it's winter and your system hasn't been generating much energy and you've been using lots of heating. The bottom line is, if you're unimpressed with your first post-solar bill, give your installer a ring. They should be happy to sit down with you and explain what you can do to get electricity costs down further. Point five. Monitoring your system performance. Focus on energy, kilowatt hours, not power, kilowatts, please. Another email I get all the time goes something like this. Hey Finn, I had a 6.6 .6 kilowatt solar system installed three months ago. After monitoring it daily, I've noticed the system is underperforming. My five kilowatt inverter has only ever hit a max of 4.8 kilowatts at any given time. Should I call my installer? Well, it's actually common not to hit your inverter's rated power output for a variety of reasons. So to answer the all important question of is my system producing what it should, you need to look at energy, kilowatt hours, not power, kilowatts. I've put a link in the description to a video that explains the difference between power and energy. To compare your generation with what's predicted, there are two tools I recommend. Number one, my solar calculator. This shows the expected generation of a solar system for your location broken down month by month. Enter your postcode, system size and direction and then hit the calculate savings. The next page will include a section that shows expected generation. Then simply compare this to what your app tells you your system has generated. Number two, Solcast. This nifty website shows expected daily solar generation based on your local weather conditions. It's really clever. 99 times out of 100 after using these tools, I see the homeowner is generating what's expected and they have nothing to worry about. So if your system isn't hitting its rated power output, don't stress. All you need to do is double check that the energy output of your system matches what's expected. If it's out by more than say 10% or so, and there's no clear explanation as to why, for example, shading, then it's time to call your installer and have a friendly chat. Point six, put away the soap and water. Why cleaning panels isn't usually worth it. As I talked about in part two of this guide, you should mount your panels with a tilt of at least 10 degrees. Having a tilt of at least 10 degrees means that your panels will self clean in the rain. There's no need to get up there yourself with a bucket of soapy water or pay someone else to. This is because cleaning tilted solar panels only increases their annual output by around 2%. If you mounted the panels flat, then you'll need to have them cleaned about four times a year probably. Many window cleaning companies offer solar panel cleaning services as well. But if you want to brave your roof yourself, not something I encourage, I don't want you to fall off and die, but 
If you do want to, all you need is soapy water to clean your panels. The exception to this don't bother cleaning advice is if you live in a particularly dirty, dusty or dry area. Constant dirt or grime buildup suffocates your panels faster than the rain can wash it off. Point seven, what kind of maintenance do solar systems need? Look, a crappy solar install can have many weak points like conduit draped over a roof that the elements can exploit. But even the best installation is still exposed to the elements. This is why a CEC accredited professional should inspect your system every five years. It's best if your original installer is the one who does this. If they're no longer around, you can use the tool I've linked to in the description to find a CEC accredited installer in your area. In some states, SAVIC and the ACT, your network operator mandates that your system gets tested every five years. It's a no brainer to get your installer to inspect the system while they're testing it. Having a full inspection every five years will identify any potential issues to nip in the bud. It will also give you the peace of mind that your system will continue to operate for years to come, giving you those lovely tiny or zero bills. Point eight, beyond solar, things to consider. A while ago, I surveyed my customers to find their main motivation for going solar. To no one's surprise, most people are in it for the money, for the savings. But many also had a strong desire to reduce their carbon footprint. They saw solar power as an easy way to reduce their bills and decrease their footprint in one go. Solar can make a huge impact on your electricity bills, but it should only be part of your energy efficiency and thus low electricity bill journey. Some other things to think about in the future are home energy efficiency, gaps, glazing, insulation. These are the big three things that can make your home more comfortable to live in. And a nice bonus is they will also lower your bills by reducing the amount of energy needed to run your home. I've put a link in the description to an article I wrote about home energy efficiency measures you can take. Battery storage. Despite the hype, batteries do not generally pay for themselves at current prices. Government rebates and virtual power plant VPP subsidies can help, but not enough in most cases. My advice is to wait a few more years for prices to come down as it's easy to retrofit a battery at a later date. When batteries do make sense, I'll be the first person to shout it from the rooftops. Electric cars. Petrol costs are major expenses for many households. This means you should put some serious thought into getting rid of them by going all electric. We're on the cusp of an electric vehicle revolution. My advice, avoid buying a new petrol car if your current car still has a few years left in it. If you absolutely have to buy a new car that burns fuel, consider a guaranteed value deal. Then, if petrol and diesel cars plummet in value in four to five years, as many experts predict, the car company takes the hit, not you. Also, think about whether you have enough solar to charge an electric car and a battery, as well as power your home. So that's that, my complete guide to owning solar. I hope you found it useful. If you have any questions, my email address is finpeacock at solarquotes.com.au. And if you happen to be watching this video but still don't own a solar system, you can use my website, solarquotes.com.au, to get up to three quotes for solar from installers that I've personally vetted and trust. Thank you for watching.